This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Middle East is bracing for possible retaliation from Israel after Iran launched 300 drones and missiles at Israel in response to Israel's recent bombing of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria. The Iranian attack caused little damage inside Israel, which intercepted nearly all the drones and missiles with help from the United States, Britain, France and Jordan. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for maximum restraint Sunday at an emergency U.N. Security Council meeting. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. As we broadcast, Israel's war cabinet is reconvening to debate how to respond to Iran's first-ever direct attack. Israeli war cabinet member Benny Gantz has vowed Israel will retaliate against Iran. In the face of the Iranian threat, we will build a regional coalition and exact the price from Iran in the fashion and timing that is right for us. And most importantly, faced with the desire of our enemies to harm us, we will continue to unite and become stronger. President Biden's reiterated his, quote, ironclad support for Israel, but he reportedly told Israel's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, that the United States will not participate in any retaliatory strikes against Iran. At the United Nations Sunday, Iran's U.N. ambassador, Saeed Aravani, defended the missile and drone attack on Israel, saying it was done in self-defense. These countries, especially the United States, have shielded Israel from any responsibility for the Gaza massacre, while they have denied Iran inherent right to self-defense against the Israeli armed attack on our diplomatic premises. At the same time, they shamefully justified the Israeli massacre and genocide against the defenseless Palestinian people under the pretext of self-defense. Iran's attacks on Israel may add new momentum for the U.S. Congress to approve more aid for Israel as the House returns to session today. For more, we go to Tehran, where we're joined by Reza Shea, freelance journalist based in Tehran, where he joins us from. Trita Parsi is executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, joining us from Washington, D.C. And later, we'll speak with Gidon Levy, award-winning Israeli journalist and author in Tel Aviv. He's columnist for the newspaper Aretz, a member of its editorial board. Uh, his re most recent piece is headlined, If Iran Attacks Israel, the Blame Lies on Israel's Irresponsible Decision Makers. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Uh, Reza Shea, let's begin with you in Tehran. Uh, can you talk about the response there in Iran's capital after uh, Iran retaliated against Israel for bombing the Iranian consulate in Damascus? Well, the, the, the people of Iran have had a variety of responses and, and sentiments. And, and I think it's, it's important to, to remind everyone that neither myself nor any journalist uh, can sit here and tell you that a, a, a population, an entire population, has a single feeling, a single voice, a single sentiment. But uh, this is what you hear oftentimes in uh, Western news media, journalists describing what an entire population is feeling uh, or, or saying. Uh, that, that's simply not the case. There, there are different uh, competing sentiments in every population, and that is the case here in, in Iran. There's a segment uh, of the population here in Iran that are staunch supporters of the clerical establishment, staunch supporters of the supreme uh, uh, leader. Uh, they believe that it's the duty of every Muslim to support and help the, the oppressed, and they view Gazans and Palestinians as, uh, as the oppressed. Uh, they're following very closely the events uh, in Gaza over the past six months. They were outraged when Iran's consulate was attacked in Syria, uh, and they cheered Iran's response over the weekend 
um, uh, when they fired those uh, rockets and those uh, drones in, in Israel. That's one segment of the population. There's another segment of the population in Iran that are staunch critics of uh, the, the, the government. Uh, they have a very different view. Uh, they want reform in the government. Some want the government gone. They don't mind when uh, senior officials of the Revolutionary Guard are assassinated. They don't mind when the establishment is undermined, when the Revolutionary Guard is undermined. They believe that the Iranian government, instead of funding Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, should help the, the, the people. Uh, so they were, they are and they remain critical of, of Iran's role uh, in, in this conflict. Uh, but it's important to point out uh, that most people here in Iran are remarkably continuing that their lives. Obviously, some people are worried. They see the headlines. They wonder what's going to happen. But remarkably, uh, they continue their lives. Uh, schools are open. Stores are open. Businesses uh, are open. And I think that speaks to the, the resilience of the Iranian people who face so many challenges over the, uh, these last 40 plus uh, years, uh, 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 isolation, uh, 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 a horrible economy, inflation, the uh, lack of uh, jobs, but, but somehow they continue uh, living while monitoring uh, what's happening. Can you talk about who died in the attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus? At least two Iranian generals, is that right? Yeah, these were uh, two Iranian uh, uh, generals um, that um, uh, that had significant roles in, in Iran's presence in, in, in Syria and the reported uh, operations that Iran has conducted uh, against uh, uh, U.S. targets in the region in Syria um, uh, uh, and, and Iraq. Um, and it's, it's important to note that um, um, that, that many people within the, within the government continue to remind everyone that this was an act of war uh, by uh, Israel, even though Israel has not confirmed that it conducted the attack in the Iranian uh, consulate. Iran continues uh, to remind the international community, they did it at the uh, UN Security Council meeting, that I Iran's uh, attack on Israel was a response to an act of war uh, that Israel carried out against an Iranian consulate, which is seen uh, as, um, as as Iranian uh, soil. It is also important to uh, point out that uh, Iran's response took two weeks, and that is in line with, with, with uh, how Iran has uh, reacted to similar uh, incidents and assassinations in, in, in recent years. You'll recall the assassination of um, uh, general Soleimani, the top-ranking revolutionary uh, guard uh, general in Iraq in, in, in 2020. You'll recall uh, Iran's response um, was to attack um, a U.S. air base in, in Iraq, but just as they did uh, with this attack in, in Israel, they took a lot of time. It is reported that they even announced what they were going to do, and that's a clear indication uh, that Iran does not want to uh, escalate uh, matters with Israel and, and the U.S. And, and regional allies, that this was, uh, as many say, a, a performative uh, operation to send uh, a message and calculated in a way uh, where the, Iran doesn't want to escalate matters. And uh, you saw Iranian officials the, uh, explicitly say that for them, the matter uh, is is over. Uh, now we wait to see if uh, if Israel agrees, if it's over for them, if they retaliate, and what Iran does after that. I want to go to John Bolton, Trump's former national security advisor, interviewed on CNN. Give us your assessment of, of an appropriate Israeli response to what Iran has now done. Well, what what is what Iran did tonight that I think was was most significant was the firing of ballistic missiles and cruise missiles from its territory directly at Israel. Uh, almost certainly at this point, none of those missiles uh, contained a nuclear warhead. But you never can tell when the next firing, the next salvo of ballistic missiles might contain a nuclear warhead. So I think among the many targets Israel should consider, this is the opportunity 
uh, to destroy I Iran's nuclear weapons program. Uh, and I hope President Biden is not trying to dissuade Prime Minister Netanyahu from doing that. So that was John Bolton uh, speaking on CNN. We're also joined by Trita Parsi, executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, speaking to us from Washington, D.C. Trita, can you respond to what Bolton said um, and also how Washington is responding right now? Well, I think you saw there in John Bolton's response, he used the word opportunity. And this is how some of the hawks view this. They see this as an opportunity to materialize the war between the United States and Iran and Israel that they have been seeking for more than 25 years. And that includes Bibi Netanyahu. I think it should not be forgotten that Netanyahu has been trying to start a war between the United States and Iran for more than two decades. And it has seen uh, him being actually rebuffed by several presidents in a row who may have been very hawkish in Iran, who may themselves have uh, contemplated the, the, uh, the idea of going to war with Iran, but who nevertheless rejected the pressure from Netanyahu to do so on behalf of Israel. But, but Bolton is reflecting that view, the idea that this is an opportunity to have a much larger war in the Middle East. And can you talk about President Biden saying that Israel has the ironclad support of the U.S., but telling uh, uh, Netanyahu um, after this attack that uh, the U.S. would not participate uh, in any kind of retaliation, though the U.S. intercepted, I think they said, um, how many— uh, um, uh, drones and something like six missiles and 90 drone strikes on the with the Iranian attack. Uh, Jordan also participated, as did Britain and France. I think what Biden is saying here is quite contradictory, because at the end of the day, there will be no distinction between offensive and defensive measures the <laughs> second the war actually breaks out. So consider this scenario. The United States does not support and does not participate in Israel's uh, counterstrikes against Iran, and the Israelis may follow uh, uh, Bolton's advice and try to target Iran's nuclear facilities. The Iranians then respond in kind with a much larger uh, uh, barrage of missiles. Clearly, what they did this time around was choreographed to minimize damage and make sure that there's no casualties. Next time around, they won't do that. Once the Iranians have uh, um, started their counterstrikes, then the United States is dragged into the war because Biden said that he will participate in the defensive measures. Uh, and then, regardless of what the previous uh, uh, measure was by the United States, the U.S. will be at war in the Middle East. And as a result, Netanyahu now has a clear pathway on how to drag the United States into this war. All he needs to do is to escalate further. The U.S. will reject that, but then the U.S. will be there uh, uh, once the Iranians are responding. And at that point, uh, the, any distinction between offensive and defensive is, is meaningless. If Biden instead makes it very, very clear that it does not lie in the U.S.'s interest to have any escalation in the region and draws a red line in front of Iran and in front of Israel, he will then not need to come to the defense of Israel, because there will not be a war to begin with. That would be a much better pathway that serves U.S. interests, that prevents any regional escalation. But so far, we have seen that Biden, even though he apparently is frustrated privately, he does not feel comfortable to draw any red lines for Israel publicly. And the ones that he has drawn privately, Netanyahu has systematically ignored for the last seven months. The Middle East is bracing for Israel to retaliate amidst claims, uh, calls for restraint after Iran fired over 350 drones and missiles at Israel in response to Israel's attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria that killed two Iranian generals and another uh, a number of other military officers. Um, we are joined by guests in Tehran and Washington, D.C., and now to Tel Aviv, where we're joined by Gidon Levy, 
an award-winning Israeli journalist and author, columnist for the newspaper Haaretz, and a member of its editorial board. His most recent piece headlined, If Iran Attacks Israel, the Blame Lies on Israel's Irresponsible Decision Makers. In it, Gidon writes, quote, For several years now, Israel's provoked Iran constantly in Lebanon, Syria, and also on Iranian soil and has not paid any price. It would be foolish to believe that the rope Israel has stretched will not break. That moment may have come. He ends by writing, just don't say again that there was no choice. There was a choice not to kill. Even if it's deserved, even if it's permitted, and even if it's possible, the person who sent the assassins put Israel at risk of war with Iran. Um, Gideon Levy, you are joined. Um, you are joining uh, Reza Saya, a freelance journalist in Tehran, Iran, and Trita Parsi, one of the heads of the Quincy Institute. Um, can you respond to Iran's attack and what Israel did to provoke that? The bombing of the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Did that surprise you? Nothing surprised here. The only thing which surprised really was the defensive capability of Israel. Together with its allies, uh, it was really impressive, but it's not a guarantee for the future. When I wrote my article, it was before the attack came, and still I thought that the assassination in Damascus was unnecessary. The problem with the Israeli armed forces and intelligence organizations is that whenever they see an opportunity, they take it, without thinking about the consequences, without thinking about the price. And until now, it was working for them, because Iran didn't react until now directly on Israel, only through its proxy. But it was very clear that it can, this cannot last forever. So those who send the assassinators to assassinate on uh, Iranian soil, on an Iranian diplomatic mission, those two generals and five more, those had to think what will be the next day. And the next day came, and we were attacked. And luckily enough, we did suffer out of this attack. The only conclusion right now should be, no, don't you dare to retaliate now because then we will be in a regional war, and that's a new game. Talk about what Benny Gantz said. As we broadcast right now, the war cabinet, Israel's war cabinet, has reconvened. What Netanyahu said, of course, they are competing with each other. If uh, Netanyahu were to go down, it's conceivable Benny Gantz would become the next prime minister. But talk about what's happening within that war cabinet. Benny Gantz. Amy, it's, Amy, it's for a long time that I claim that those who want to get rid of Netanyahu are obviously right, but they hope that the alternative will be any better on core issues. On many issues, it will be much better. But on core issues like apartheid, occupation, continuing the war in Gaza, will be very, very disappointed. And here we go. Benny Gantz, who is the alternative, who is the liberal alternative, who is the dovish alternative of Israel, he speaks exactly like Netanyahu and would act exactly like Netanyahu when it comes to core issues, to core questions like launching an assassination, like launching a war, like using the military power of Israel. And that's really very, very depressing that there is no alternative thinking in Israel and no lessons out of the experience. All the assassinations that Israel committed, all of them, never led to anywhere. Nothing good came out of them, except of the ego of the, the, the organizations who stood behind it. And here comes this Benny Gantz, the big hope of the liberal Israel, and suggests to continue the war, to make it worse, to go for a regional war with Iran. That's really, really very depressing. Are you concerned, Gideon Levy, um, that what's happening with Iran now is taking attention away from what's happening in Gaza, where the death toll just continues to mount, over close to 34,000 people, just the official death toll is expected to be much higher, uh, and where the—, the um, 
Resistance was mounting in the United States, for example, on President Biden not to arm Israel, given what's happening in Gaza, um, that uh, now the House, uh, which is notoriously divided, is perhaps coming together around giving more aid to Israel. It goes without saying, not only Gaza is forgotten. Also, look what is happening in the West. Pogrom after pogrom, and nobody cares anymore. The army collaborates in those pogroms. We have videos from the last days in which the army not only stands aside, but many times take part of those pogroms against the Palestinians, and nobody pays attention, to, not to speak, obviously, about Gaza, because everyone is now concerned about Iran. But Gaza is still starving and bleeding, and we shouldn't forget it, even not for a moment, like we shouldn't forget the hostages who are still there. But it seems that uh, now everyone is only concerned about retaliating uh, Iran. This would be such a major, maybe fatal mistake. I wanted to bring back in Reza Sayah. Um, you were based in Cairo, Egypt, when you covered the negotiations between Israel and Hamas in 2014, as Israel launched its assault on Gaza then. Can you talk about what unfolded back then and how it compares to the negotiations that are taking place, what, in Doha and Cairo now for a ceasefire? Well, obviously, back then, what took place, as is taking place right now on a smaller scale, was was the killing of, uh, of lots of innocent civilians. But one thing that sticks out in my mind in 2014 in covering that conflict was the Israeli government's flat-out refusal to negotiate. There were so many instances when I was talking to Hamas uh, leaders who were in Cairo. And in these instances, they would tell me that the Israeli officials who were supposed to show up, you know, for those negotiations simply would not show up. And this was something that was not widely reported uh, by Western U.S. Uh, media, um, the, uh, the Israeli government's uh, uh, seeming unwillingness uh, to negotiate uh, with, with Hamas. Uh, eventually, there there was uh, negotiations, and that war ended. But in subsequent year, years and leading up to this conflict, uh, the, the cycle of of war continued. But that's something that sticks out in my mind in that 2014 conflict. I wanted to ask about Jordan's position in all of this, Trita Parsi. What role it plays? You had. The United States, Britain, Jordan, um, France, all intercepting some of these uh, drones and, uh, and missiles. Yes, numerous countries participated in the interception of these missiles. And the only reason they could do so was because the Iranians had given them 72 hours heads up uh, uh, deliberately, because the entire the purpose of this exercise was not to inflict damage, but to restore uh, what the Iranians believe is their deterrence and showcase their capability. And as Gideon said, the shooting down of these uh, missiles were quite impressive. But I think we also have to keep in mind that there might be a different scenario in the future in which there is no forewarning of these attacks. And as a result, France, Britain and the United States will not be able to uh, uh, prepare for and participate in this extent uh, in the shooting down of the missile. And then, as a result, it's not entirely clear to what extent the Israeli air defenses would be capable of handling what would like to be a much larger barrage of uh, uh, missiles sh shot at Israel. So I think the Israelis may have also picked up that at the end of the day, uh, a military confrontation, even though Israel, of course, is much stronger in Iran and certainly the U.S. is, but nevertheless will be very, very damaging to Israel as well. And that, I think, is one of the key messages the Iranians were trying to send. These, the Jordanians are, of course, caught in the middle there, because all of these different things are then flying over Jordanian airspace. Uh, and the Jordanian position has been that they're defending their airspace. They're not defending Israel. This is not done in order to necessarily help the Israelis. It's to make sure that Jordan asserts that no war should be taking place on its 
territory or in its airspace. That nevertheless is a tough position for the Jordanians to take given the very, very strong sentiments that are now uh, uh, boiling over inside of Jordan because of the population's frustration with what is happening in Gaza and their perception that the Jordanian government and the Arab world at large have been helpless and not done enough to prevent the slaughter. I wanted to ask Gideon Levy if you've been surprised by the amount of uh, conversation going on between Iran and the United States, perhaps not directly. Um, and also, I want to put that question to Reza Saya, but um, where the result is you have the United States saying they will not participate in I Israel's retaliation if they retaliate against Iran. Uh, first of all, uh, I would say uh, we always portray Iran as a crazy state, as an insane state, and it might be described like this. But in this case, it was very measured, very measured. I wish the United States and Iran would have spoken much more. I wish the agreement, the nuclear agreement, would be still valid and we would be in a much better place and safer place rather than what both Donald Trump and Netanyahu arranged us, cancelling this, this agreement, which was the best way to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. The more they speak, the better, under the table, above the table, behind the curtains, any, any way to talk to them. I still believe that every regime has its own interest and dialogue is, by the end of the day, the best way, even if it's the Satan of Iran. And can you talk, as you talked about what's happening also on the West Bank, if you can talk about the most recent news about the death of one of the most prominent Palestinian prisoners in an Israeli prison, died of cancer, novelist Walid Daka, who spent the past 38 years locked up for his involvement in an armed group um, that abducted and killed an Israeli soldier in 1984, rights groups pressuring Israel to release him, saying he was in dire need of medical attention, Amnesty International calling for his release, saying that since October October 7th, he'd been tortured, humiliated, and died family visits. You've written about this. I'm following this story for many, many years. I even visited Walid once in jail many years ago. It's one of those horrible stories which tells you much more than the story itself. Walid Dhaka is an Israeli. He is not a Palestinian from the West Bank. He's an Israeli Palestinian. He, by the way, didn't murder. He participated in a group which kidnapped an Israeli soldier and then killed him. Some of them, he was not involved in it, but he was charged for murder and everything fine. He said 37 years for this murder, much more than any murderer in the world, in, in Israel, not in the world. He, in this period, changes declared that he had enough with terror, declared that he regrets any terror action. He's exactly the style of leadership that we should look forward Those Palestinians who change their minds and leave terror as a tool. But no, for Israel, no Palestinian is good enough. And here in the last years start really a sadistic uh, uh, behavior toward him and his family. No visits. When he started to be ill in cancer, when he got ill, no visits, half a year now. They didn't even inform the family that he's dying. They didn't even inform the family he died. And now it's already 10 days, they don't even return the body and don't let the moon in their home. I mean, what is more sadistic than this? And what is more the face of this current government of Israel when it comes to Palestinians, any Palestinians or Palestinians from the West Bank or Gaza? Sadism is the name of the game.
And I wanted to give Reza Saya the last word. Uh, in U.S. media, we don't often hear from people in Tehran. You're a freelance journalist there in the capital of Iran. You've been covering Iran's relationship with Hamas, uh, particularly in the aftermath of October 7th. Could you expand on this and what you think it's most important for people to understand uh, outside of Iran and particularly here in the United States? Well, I, I think from the people's standpoint, the people here are resilient. Most of them are peace-loving uh, people who do not uh, want war. Uh, and I want to follow up on Mr. Levy's thought about how Iran is often portrayed in Western media uh, to the American and Western audience as a radical, reckless, uh, violent uh, uh, government. And I think a lot of thoughtful analysts will tell you um, that a radical entity, a radical government, would not last for 45 years, like the Islamic uh, Republic that has. And these these analysts will tell you that the reason that they have survived for these 45 plus years is that they're not reckless, that they're very calculating and they're measured. And they understand at this very high stakes juncture that there are forces that perhaps Israel wants to bait them into a, a, a wider war. And I think Iran understands that that would be a, a, a mistake. Uh, I think many here understand that if they get baited into a wider war, it would be a distraction uh, to what's happening in Gaza that has served the establishment here well by uh, getting them a lot of uh, political clout. And it would also potentially uh, galvanize and, and unite Israel with its uh, Western allies, Western allies that have been critical of Israel and their operation uh, in, in Gaza. So uh, at this hour, they're waiting to see what Israel does if Israel retaliates. But history has shown that if Israel re retaliates, uh, Iran is going to be aware of what their response is uh, could cost, and they're going to take um, a, a measured response. It's obviously a very high-stakes chess game and a lot of people anxious to see what happens.